coming, Vic Casey. The water's cold. Oh, oh. It's so good for you. Remove those strange skins you wear. From what animal do they come? The wild silk moth. It roams in Bloomingdale's. <gasps> fur! You have fur! I have what? The Zambuli men do not have fur in their bodies. This cannot be. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about feature films based on comic books and comic strips that people have stopped talking about. We're your hosts, Jordan and Kumar. That's me. And me. And this week we're talking about Sheena from 1984, based on Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Pause the podcast. Oh, I always forget about this. <laughs> oh, you go. What do you think? No. Uh, there's no surprises. No, this is no constantly cliched. Uh, N- um... There are absolutely no surprises. I no no. So yeah, don't pause the podcast. Yeah, don't watch this film. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. So, Sheena was created in 1938 by Will Eisner and Jerry Eager. Right, and or like a either. lot of comics from this time, it's dubious as to who exactly. Came uh, yeah, up there's some arguments about who named it, who came up with the idea. Blah blah it's blah. It's like Batman all over again. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. No. It's not quite Batman. Level, it's not one get... guy trying to steal. <laughs> I knew you would get away with people. that. No, <laughs> it's just um, these these Eisner told different stories about his career over yep. the years, and they eager did too. Um, I'm not sure. It was a very long time ago. This is like early mid 30s that they founded this studio. Oh yeah. How would we know Will Eisner? Will Eisner's most famous for the Spirit, so we will be coming back to him at some stage. Yeah. And I go. What would we know him from? Well, I don't. I don't know if he was Sheena. famous. <laughs> Sheena, yeah, kidding. it's about it. Uh, but what they did was in thirty, in the mid thirties, they were creating comics to sell to publishers. In the sense that the publishers at the time were just reprinting newspaper strips. That's what a comic book was. Just right. bundles of reprints. But they were starting to run out of content. So they were like this is early days content providers, content creators. It would be like YouTubers. So they were like making comics and selling those comics like on to publishers that needed content. Yeah. But why did they newspaper strips and Yeah. They need something to put in their comic yeah. books. So they they just they produce tons of material. So, so they this had a is studio like a strip full of that was artists. never in a newspaper almost. That's right. Mm. And they would uh, they would make up pseudonyms so it seemed like they had a much bigger <laughs> studio than they actually did. Like Amazing. they had fifteen guys working for them instead of five or whatever. Um so there was a, they produced this, there was this comic called Wags. I think it was a British or Australian thing, and they were running out of content before the U.S. I guess so they produced started producing pages of this comic Sheena under the name W. Morgan Thomas. Now, so every every one pager starts out. It says Sheena, Queen of the Jungle by W. Morgan Thomas, and at the bottom of the page it's signed by Mort Meskin. So I don't know who they were trying to fool because he <laughs> signed his art with his own name anyway. Amazing. So there's this kind of craziness going on. Uh, incidentally, um, sometimes uh, sometimes the internet credits this pseudonym as the creator. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not, a, not a real guy. <laughs> also, I mean, another thing about how little we know about Eisner and Eager is that if you Google them now, of course you get all these YouTube hits about heads of Disney. Because there was Eisner in the 80s and there was right. Eager Now or something. So right. it's like this coincidence oh. that these two guys <laughs> with course. the same names of course. Right. come up. Uh, so there was, uh, according to Will Eisner, he based Sheena, the name on She, the H. Ryder Haggard novel. I would say probably not just the name. I think right, that sure. this comic has some very clear literary antecedents, yeah. which I suppose I can talk a bit more about once we mention what it's about. Yes. So I'm, I'll also men- mention uh, the one on Wikipedia mentions is Rima the Jungle Girl. Oh, uh, from Green Mansions. By William Henry Hudson. So you can also already see H. Ryder Haggard, William Henry Hudson... W. Morgan Thomas. They were even trying to come up with a name that sounded like one of those Edgar guys. Edgar Rice Tarzan. Yes. The apes. Yeah. 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 So it's a, a, a three. A three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, although Rima a was. Uh, name. Yes. So Rima was earlier, 1904, and yes. Tarzan was 1912. Yes, and um, uh, she's uh, 1887. Yes. So we sort of have a, a kind of 30 year spread. 
Yeah. Which you could argue is contributing. I, I don't know too much about Rima, but certainly Tarzan and she are both, the, yeah. I would say, the very clear kind of like inspirations for this right. comic. So we had these um, Mort Meskin pages, which were just like, they were like in one page chapters. I guess they were trying to make it look like a Sunday strip or something. I'm not sure what the logic was behind. I, I, maybe the language of comics hadn't really gotten to the point where like they were It's like you said before, stories. like they're just providing strips without a paper. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, then, in 1941, Sheena got her own title. Mm. Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Supposedly the first female type superhero... It seems like it, because title, you... To have her own title? precedes Wonder Woman by a, a matter of months, right? Yeah, right. And uh, you you looked up Nilvana of the North. Yeah, Nilvana of the Northern Lights. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, she that doesn't was quite. Later, yeah, yeah. A yeah. Bit later. So it seems it seems like unless uh, anyone wants to write in and prove us wrong, it seems like Sheena is the first female comic book yeah. heroine. So in these initial stories, what we get is. It just starts in Media's Res. There's these two guys, uh, Bob Reynolds and Professor Van Dyke. Yep. They're just in the woods. They're automatically captured. Panel 2, they've been captured by Sheena. Sheena doesn't speak any English. She locks them up in a cave, basically. And they're like, we got to prove that we're friends. We're here on friendly terms. So the first thing they do is they go out and they beat up one of her men <laughs> to prove that they're friends, I guess. Uh, then they get taken to her, uh, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't speak any English. And then she, and then, but the, like the head guy, witch doctor, I think they call him, does speak English. And okay. he tells her, he tells these two guys the whole story of how this white woman became queen of the jungle or queen of this tribe. Yes. So he's ba she's basically a Tarzan type, she's, as we've said. She's Tarzan crossed with Aisha from She. Yes. So everyone's familiar with Tarzan, you know, white guy. Lost in the jungle. Even the kid. Phantom a little bit. I don't. What, you know, and the Phantom right. is a, a sacred lineage of right. of phantoms. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yes. All of whom but it's are also some white. white, dude. Right? Uh, oh, yeah, they are white, but he, he it's fa father son thing. Right. Uh, but yes, but uh, this one's the famous. It's kind of like lost child. Yes. You know, raised by wolves, but in this case apes. Uh, and he becomes kind of like uh, the master of the apes, right? right. Swinging around, right. Doing jungle stuff. Uh, people might be less familiar with she. But actually, you are familiar with she because every time a tribe is ruled by a priestess or a witch or a, a, a sexy evil woman, yeah, this is hey, try to haggard she appearing again. Yeah, I think uh, Brian Aldiss in Billionaire Spree, he actually he says this is the wellspring from which this trope springs. Mm. Right. Uh, yeah. So in she, uh, there's a, a a lost tribe in the in darkest Africa and run by a woman called. Aisha, or she who must be obeyed, mm. and uh, uh, she's white, but she's not European. She's sort of from an ancient race because she's thousands of years old. Okay, right. And uh, she's very uh, ambitious, malevolent, and uh, quite frighteningly sexual, mm. which Sheena isn't. But Sheena in the comic is very much the ruler of the tribe. Yes. So Tarzan doesn't rule tribes. He just sort of hangs out with his monkey pals. Sheena, on the other hand, is the queen of a of an African tribe, yes. and they do everything she says. Yes, and Tarzan seems to be able to speak to apes. Right. Sheena, initially at least, we don't see her use that power. No. She just seems to be... I'm, so I'm going to read a bit about the origin here. So in Jumbo Comics number one, we get four or five pages, and we learn when the witch doctor tells his tale that the Mongol hordes mm. came down through Asia, through Europe, and came to Africa, and then some of them settled here, and they like mixed with a local tribe. So they've got some artifacts here. Yeah. This then, is classic. Um, this is classic for the period, kind of like uh, scientific racism yeah. of the late nineteenth, early twentieth centuries. The idea that Africans were incapable of civilization, right? And that if there are artifacts, cities, or, or any kind of drive to what we would associate with modern culture, it must be coming external. I would say this is still, when people say that the pyramids were built by aliens, it's yeah, the same. It's the same thing. It's, it's still, exactly it's the ongoing. same trope. That's yeah. right. The, the same concept. And um, uh, in fact, all through this comic, most of the time, the clash or, or the, the conflict is not between Sheena and Africans, but between Sheena and other and Europeans. Yes. Or bizarrely, Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we're so I just want to get it. I want to read. This, oh, sorry. I cut you I want to read this page of the witch doctor explaining the story. Yes, yes, yes. Please, please. So sorry. this is after the hordes. Many, much later. He says, "Many moons ago, a white man such as you wandered into our land. With him, he brought a little 
white girl with hair the color of corn. He was a very learned man, and soon he and I became very friendly. He wrote much and studied our ancient relics. In return for my services, he taught me your language. Corn, incidentally, there would be no corn in there would be no corn. at this point. What about strawberries? I'm going to talk about that when you get to the movie. <laughs> After he had written much in his books, he wished to leave, but I would not let him go. So I brewed a curse on him, and soon, as the result of my magic, he died. To retain my power over my people, I made Sheena a goddess. She is cunning and knows the great jungle. My people follow her, and though she is a woman, she is fearless in battle. Hmm. Now, I have several questions about this. <laughs> he was friendly with the guy, so he killed him when he tried to leave. And also, if he tries to leave or he's dead, it's the same result. Why Why bother killing him? Why put a curse on him and kill him? So, why does he need to retain his power over his people? He hasn't said anything about him losing his own power at this stage. So, But why does he made her a goddess? So, somehow that so she's a puppet to his... I, none of this yeah. makes any sense. But yeah. then he says she's cunning and knows the jungle. I'm like, wait a second, I thought she was just a puppet? She's like a little girl on this panel. I don't think we're meant to take away that she's a puppet. I think this is just a, a an, an origin story that's that's not very well thought out. No. And in fact, none of the stories in this are very well thought no. out. No. Although it, I this would is say just these pure trash. the the jumbo comics, the Mort Meskin drawn ones. I mean, it's Mort Meskin art. It's early Mort Meskin art, but. It's okay. When we yeah, get to the Sheena comic, it's we're getting into we need to produce product as fast as pass, as possible land. And the, the 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 content is yeah, as you say, the art's no good, and the the stories are just pulp trash. Yes. Yeah. You know, we have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a there's one like German. I guess it's Nazis. Except it's early days of the war. Yes, and they they want to. They're sick of being stuck at home because of the war, and they want to <laughs> go out and do some hunting or something. You know, you, it's always a worry when Nazis show up. Although this is actually this is actually being written by it <laughs> during the Second World War, so go figure. But you know, their accents aren't even consistent. Sometimes they pronounce their W's as V's. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. In one, uh, a Nazi was actually a Nazi scientist that actually looks like Hitler was in Sheena's jungle 25 years earlier, <laughs> so even before there were Nazis, and then comes back 25 years later to get. He wants to a serum to make. They can't even make up their minds about this story. Mm -hmm. He wants two things. He wants a serum to make gorillas gigantic <laughs> so that he can use them <laughs> as an army, and he also wants a skull, an insanely valuable skull. Right. And we find out, why is this skull so valuable? They never tell us yeah. until the very final panel mm -hmm. when it says, this is a Cro-Magnum skull and thus incredibly valuable. Ah. I also have questions. Cro-Magnum, famously European fossils, <laughs> not <laughs> African. What is it doing in Africa? Yeah. And also, you know, fossils, they're interest, of interest to science, but not, generally speaking, fantastically valuable objects. Right. Uh, sometimes they're, they show up looking for a mine or something. They're yeah. like, oh, oh and I want to know where her secret mine is. Yeah. Sheena has a secret right. mine and she they're like, secret mine. Find it. Some, white, some white dudes will show up trying to get it. There's all sorts of chaos. So when we shift to the series, it's almost like they've rebooted Sheena. This is like a different version. So it's in color now. The original jumbo strips are in black and white. Yeah. These ones are in color. Very poorly drawn. It's not more Mexican art. Uh, so now she's hanging out with Bob. Bob seems to be living in the jungle with her. Yes. She speaks English fine. Yeah. In fact, everyone speaks English. And no, no, no. You know what? She doesn't speak English fine. She actually speaks it kind of like Baby Superman oh, does. I think her, but There's hers is of... better than the tribe. Like her tribe are, have real pigeon English. Yeah. And she's kind of like... Yeah. And why, why are they... Everyone speaks English, but it, it's crap English. And in fact, yeah. they're often thinking. Yes. It's like Superman's <laughs> yeah. terrible, like the baby English, me, me like yeah, yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, questions. Why are they all talking to one another in Pigeon English? Why aren't they just talking in their native language? Why are they thinking Absolutely. In, in Pigeon English? Yeah. yeah. Why do the Germans think in phonetic <laughs> German accented oh, yeah. English? <laughs> yeah. This is just, it, it's trash. So she has a, uh, a there's a, a monkey she calls Chim. Yep. Short for chimpanzee, I guess. If you know the figure drawing of the humans was bad, Chim is drawn really badly. Strange, like, like his arms are like like three times the length of his body sometimes, stuff yeah. like that. So another thing that tends to happen in the in her own series, the color stories, is Bob will get captured and tied up. Yes. Chim will untie him, <laughs> often at the command of Sheena. Yeah. And then Sheena will come in and you know rescue Bob, which is fine. They've, one in this one comic story, has solved how to get your heroes out of bonds. In one story, he gets captured and he's he's strung up like they're gonna almost like they're gonna cook him, like in 
Return of the Jedi. And mm. um, he then, for some reason, Sheena shows up with one of her tribe at this village where he's been captured. Yeah. And they decide to set the place on fire, even though Bob is there. And yeah. And they're like, wait, I'm like, wait a second, he's in there and you're setting the place on fire? And they're like, well, let's look for Bob. And they're still carrying him around on that stake like they're about to cook him, even though the whole village is on fire. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They drag him out on the, it's, on the stake. It's crazy. And then at the end, uh, like the the enemy tribe, one of the guys from the enemy tribe says, well, we didn't like our leader. We want to make peace with you, Sheena. The end. Just yeah. ends just like that. Yeah. And their whole village has been burned down. Quite often, another thing that happens is some enemy tribe will show up and Sheena will say, oh, that's that tribe we beat in war last year. They want revenge. This happens more than once mm. um, where this tribe wants revenge. And they're really, I mean, if you were writing this now, you'd be thinking about, well, why were you warring on them last year? And what did this victory really entail? And why do these guys want revenge? It's just, this is just the savage Africa. They're just constantly warring on one another. They're just constantly... And in fact, more often, I think, than, than this kind of like intertribal conflict occurring is, as I said earlier, there will usually be a, a nefarious European yeah. behind this intertribal conflict. So, or if, if not a nefarious European, then a, a Sheena equivalent. So mm. another femme fatale. Well, unlike Sheena, this will be a femme fatale. Yeah. So lounging on pillows, once Bob is a sex slave, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wearing a bikini instead of a wholesome leopard skin loin dress like uh, Sheena wears uh, or so I mean so usually the evil characters are the Europeans but that's not a subversion that's not saying look at the dangers of empire because usually because when Sheena will capture these guys she'll give them to the colonial police right who are unambiguously presented as goodies yeah it's more to do with the fact that the the uh, native characters have no agency right so they're not capable of coming up with their own plots. They're just pliable children most of the time, waiting for some unscrupulous Westerner or Arab or uh, nefarious. There's definitely at sexy least woman. one where enemy tribe where there are no European. It, There's it like does happen. Or twice it does happen, but more often, yes. so much that yes. it's a characteristic of the strip, is the fact that these the natives are just tools in the hands of yes. more active. And that's very typical of kind of... Well, this is the whole white saviour trope. Yeah. I mean, this is not exclusive to Sheena. This is characterises mass media from right up to yeah. the present, arguably. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something you alluded to is her state of dress or undress. Uh, so we have to say that this really... This comic exists to show skin. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't think there's any... Because the plots are so dumb. I really yeah. think this is a... It's legit way for 10 year old boys to spend their 10 cents to get a Sheena comic and have a comic that shows a lot, of, very poorly drawn, but shows a lot of skin. Right. And issue one has the, she's in the broke back pose on the cover of issue one where she's turned around so you can see You're her butt and her breast. That. <laughs> it's the Hawkeye pose, isn't it? Not the broke back pose. It's it's called the broke back pose. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, I've heard it described as a broke okay. back pose because she's turned around. The, when the female character is turned around, so you can see her butt and her breasts at the same right. time. Right, and anatomically impossible. Yeah. And it's common to comic books. Yeah. So visualize a character where you can see both their butt and their both their breasts yeah. at the same time. I've seen it called Hawkeye oh. pose after a, a a gimmick where they redrew Hawkeye in all of those. It was a female, the Brokeback poses. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, Brokeback. Got it. I, I might be... I might no, 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 that, that one makes more sense because Hawkeye is a riff on... Yes. ...a pre-existing yeah. concept, right? Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we need to say about Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, the comic books? I don't I know. had trouble reading more than... Like, I read, like, an issue, and it was hard work. I read all of them, but they just blur together. Yeah. Because it, it really is just pulp. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very much so. It's it's chiefly interesting, I suppose, for these um, problematic kind of like tropes that we that we see the white savior. Yeah. The uh, the fact that you know the lack of agency for the natives. I suppose. And interestingly, Arabs are in it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because this and their slave is often they have scimitars. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, Sheena. Sheena will get captured by an Arab slaver, and then a day's march away, they'll be in Arabia. <laughs> and there'll be minarets and a big slave market. It's like, where is this supposed to be yeah. taking place? Yeah. Who cares, nerd? Just, <laughs> just look at Sheena in a leopard skin. Yeah. Uh, and I guess, annoyingly, having said that, irritatingly, the stories will be interspersed with educational pages. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> where it'll talk about, you know, like, the elephant. These are long issues. They're like 60 pages, these comics. are like, it's not like your modern 22-page comics. It's like a 60-page story, though. I mean, there's No, no, no. There's, there's like five or six stories. And there, and as you said, a bunch of... And then you, there, you will have, like, some facts about, and some pictures of elephants. Yeah. And some facts about the African elephant. Yeah. But also just straight up nonsense, like leopard warriors and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They just made that shit yeah. up. There's no leopard warriors. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like witch doctors. So th yeah. This is, this is just the... the, 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 the <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is, this is just really like pulp. Yeah. By the way, if you're wondering why people were publishing comic books in such quantity that they were desperate for content to fill the comics. Right. They were mostly smuggling alcohol. And they oh, you've mentioned this the, before, yeah. The comics to ship them. They needed to send comic book shipments with actually alcohol in the boxes. Amazing. Yeah. So that, well, again, yeah, you've mentioned that before, actually. The origins of the comics industry in, in like, bootlegging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 1955-1956, we had a TV series which ran for uh, 26 episodes. Mm -hmm. Her outfit is quite chaste in that one. I had to scrub through an episode or two on YouTube. Um, uh, yeah, the actor is a model called Irish McCalla. Right. She's very comely. But as you say, it's uh, it's the 1950s. Yeah, there's no midriff showing or anything like that. She's she's covered in this kind of one one piece leopard outfit, as I guess she is sometimes. Um, I want to... So as I was scrubbing through these on YouTube, I saw one episode had a comment on it that I have to read. <laughs> I don't. Okay. We don't normally read YouTube comments on the show, but I'm this sure we was. Ever have. <laughs> this was something else. The comment was: This is on episode three of the 1955 black and white TV series. Amazing. Sorry, folks. This is the black and white version of the uh, Jungle Warriors, but American. Americanizes and very sexist. In the comics, she is female version of Tarzan, who is eco nature champion. So enjoy the fun and games, and then go back and read the excellent comics. <laughs> Did Will Eisner write this comment? <laughs> <laughs> no, Will Eisner can make sentences. I don't think. Uh, I don't Will, know who Will would Eisner's say that. The, ghost. I don't know who would assume that read this comic think it's not Americanized and sexist. It's, it's crazy to me that somebody would think no. This TV series is is bad in the comics. Could it be legit? that they've read one of the more recent? Oh yeah, because there are current. Yeah, so it's Sheena been rebooted comics. about three times in the last forty years or so. Yeah, most recently I think in twenty fourteen. There's like a current series from IDW or something. Oh Like wow. recent, okay. like yeah. So maybe he thinks a nineteen fifties TV show was oh, based, yeah. on, based a, on it. Yeah. On a comic published in like the twenty tens. Yeah. And there was 35 episodes of a T-series from 2000, which was, you know, that era of the 90s and early 2000s where they were producing We've fantasy about and the Nexus, shows. Uh, we, yeah, yeah. Mostly in Canada. I don't know if that one was, but um, there was just like... Apparently that partic this particular iteration was a shapeshifter. Yes. Well, we'll talk about Sheena's powers. <laughs> <laughs> we get to this movie that just came out in 1984. From Columbia Pictures. Yeah. Now, this is an era, I, you know, now you watch a movie and you see the names of six production companies, you go through all their logos. Back in the day, a major studio would just be like, we're gonna make this movie, and they would make it, and they chose to make Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, just called Sheena. Yeah. Uh, we get a 15 minute cold open. Yeah. Um, it starts with a, a man and a woman in a Jeep, driving out somewhere in the jungle. They've got a picture of a man, a black man who's covered in tumors, and the woman says, but how can he still be, this photo was taken two weeks ago, how can he still be alive? So it's like, wh who said he was alive? Doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yes. They sh stop the Jeep suddenly because there's a head in the road, like buried in the sand. That's a pretty arresting image. I thought it was, this guy was alive, and then I thought he was dead. Then I thought, uh, oh, it's supposed to be a head? Just a headless body? I couldn't tell what was going on for a while. They stop, um, they get out, and they want, for some reason, the man and woman are scientists. They brought their little daughter. They want this sand to study. And then this African guy comes out, tribal, this tribe, tribal guy comes out. Yep. He says, no, this is sacred ground. You can't take it. Yep. And then they, then the jungle drums start, tribal dance starts. Yep. And suddenly this head that was of this guy in the sand, he's, they pull him out like he was dead and he's come back to life. So this was the guy with the tumors. It was very, it wasn't put together in a way that made sense to me. Right. Um, but no, yes, this, is, this big, was the guy with the tumors. And it's he's, a big kind of like big jamboree. Like they light up some enormous yeah. pyres. Uh, they they all dance around like maniacs. So it's all very 
Heart of Darkness. Yeah, I first, so I turned on this movie. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, but I was kind of hoping, okay, it'll, hopefully it'll either be good for women or good for black. Oh, you, you sweet and as soon as, this, <laughs> as soon as this tribal <laughs> dance started, I was like, oh, geez, sacred ground, talk, all the sacred ground talk, and I, yeah. the dance, and I was just like, oh, no. But, it, I mean, it improves, I say, I would say in some regards. But we'll get to that. So uh, then, <laughs> then Janet and her parents—I don't know if we ever learn their names—are uh, end up staying, live, staying with the tribe, and they're going to study this sand there. And they think it's well, coming from this cave, this it, mountain it cave. It might be the very next day. Could I, be I the don't next. Know if they've been there very long. I don't know. They're very comfortable. But yeah, it could be the next day. Uh, uh, you know, and they. Yeah, she, Janet has an age. So she's this... like three or four years old. I'd say she's. Yeah. She can say mom, mommy. I don't know if she has any other words, but anyway. It's interestingly because this thing with the the magic earth, the healing earth, they call it. This is just vanishes from the plot until yes, the until very, very until the, until the last, last scene of the movie. The very last yeah. scene of the film. Yeah. It's an interesting. So the parents. They want to find the source of the magic. They decide it's probably in a nearby cave in the mountain. They go in, uh, but Janet, the daughter, tries to follow them in. There's a cave in. The parents are killed. The parents scream, yeah. Janet! <laughs> and that causes the cave and they yeah, die. That's silly. And then the priestess of the tribe says, The prophecy has come true. We were going to get a. We, the prophecy said that a, a white girl would come and be uh, the wise leader of our tribe. I know, the, not a white kid. A golden god child. A golden god child. Okay. <laughs> Strap your your imperialist goggles on and and, so, and have a listen to that. By guy. the way, there's some real Superman vibes happening here. When she comes out of the cave and the smoke's around, it's a lot like Kal-El coming out of that rocket up this. Yes. Uh, I, I I noticed that. Too. And the music the music too is a bit Superman-y yeah. around this scene and where he's being she's being told the prophecy about how she's gonna be the leader of the tribe. Incidentally, the uh, the little girl is um, topless. Which is, you know, yeah. Even the, kids. even the, and it just occurred to me. I made the same comment about Superman, where we yes. see uh, full frontal <laughs> little baby Superman nudity, yeah. and it occurred to me that well, that, we, she's top us even the twelve or thirteen year old version or, here, which is a little um, discombobulated. But we had that both. Remember both of those? Um, I think it was both the Fatty Finn movies had the swimming scenes where the kids were just completely butt right. naked in there as well. Yeah. I want to say another era, the so 1980s. Not only is another era. This movie is supposedly rated PG. This is how and there this is film got a PG full rating. Full-on Playboy nudity yeah. in this movie. Now it's supposedly non-sexualized, and I think the MPAA got more conservative in the '90s, where any nudity would get you an R rating. Definitely. At oh, this yeah. period, it seemed like "quote unquote" non-sexual nudity you could still get a PG. Yeah, it seems like. Well, that's the only explanation. And in fact, that's that was my point. I mean, but another thing is, there's a scene where a guy. You never see any nudity whatsoever in a film that gets a PG rating now. Yeah, yeah. And indeed, plenty of films that go right up to kind of like an M rating, especially the nudity of children, which by definition is not sexual. Yeah. Uh, whereas here we are in the 1980s, it was... This film, as you said, is rated PG, and parts of it are like... A, it's like, as you said, it's like a Playboy film. Yeah. Sheena is completely naked. Two scenes. She's a shower scenes. scene? <laughs> and then she's a swimming scene, which is non-sexual because she's bathing, but it's played sexually because the guy is like... There's a guy with, there with her and... Watching her. You don't... There's nothing is left to the imagination. No. There's no tasteful leaves. Well, well, you know, there's no convenient leaves or soap yeah. bubbles. She's just completely naked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I just couldn't so, believe it. And this is rated PG. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the uh, there's another scene where a guy gets stabbed in the throat with a spear and you see it. That's and that would get an R rating. Because it's a, like a, you, a graphic I, murder. I don't like to correct you. We do cut away. We see the spear at his throat. It cuts away to the oh, guy holding the spear. Okay. And he pushes it forward. Yes. but then And then we, we cut the back and it's embedded in his throat. So we don't see <laughs> what I might call penetration. Okay. <laughs> but... You, you are quite right. This is a, we're obviously an era like coming out of the seventies or something where we're much faster and looser with what guess, counts yeah. as a as a film that's suitable for children. Yeah. So Janet grows up in the tribe. The uh, the priestess, the shaman, as they call her, is some kind of she was played by some kind of princess. She's played by a, a genuine princess from I'm not sure what country she's from, but she's called Princess Elizabeth, Elizabeth of Toro. Elizabeth of Toro. Yeah. So. She grows up with the tribe. There's a hilarious scene where she's like wrapped up with a by this python, like just hanging out. Yep. Um, 
the animal work on this film is uh, lots of great animals much in this movie. The, uh, pretty much the best thing about it, aside from Sheena's nudity. <laughs> uh, I would say some of the cinematography, which we'll talk about. Oh yeah. Um, so she learns all these things, including that they have the power to summon animals. They basically put their hands on their foreheads. That's really silly. They make a little. Um, they make a cup out of their and hands. And a cup, and they put it on their and forehead. And they put it on their forehead. And the priestess, the shaman, really goes into a full trance, like eye-rolling trance. Yeah. And she can summon, like, an elephant to her to do her bidding. Sheena, when she's a little kid, summons a little hedgehog. Yeah. Um, they're speaking English all the time now. Yes. Uh, the priestess spoke English. Sheena speaks English with an American accent. I don't know where she learned it from since she's living with this tribe. <laughs> She landed in the Bronx, apparently. Uh, so finally, 15 minutes in, we get Tanya Roberts, who at this stage in her career would have been 25, 26 years old. Uh, the year after this, she was in View to a Kill, mm. which is probably the worst Bond film, but my favorite, because uh, <laughs> I saw it at the cinema when I was a kid, and I always remember her from that movie. Now, now we get the credits. Oh, by the way, the credits are over her. She's riding a zebra, <laughs> and it's just her from the waist up, so it looks like she's, she's barebacking. Pardon the expression, this zebra. Well, I believe it's um, a technical term. It is a te it is an original term, but it's like really, she's bouncing, bouncing, she's barely in bounce, right. and also bounce. It's you like five minutes of costume, of uh, which is even even more risque. Is risque the word? It's barely it's there. It's revealing, yeah. There's it, yeah. revealing, of course, is the word. It's even more revealing than the original comic one. Yeah. Certainly more re revealing than the 1950s iteration. Yeah. It, it's two scraps of leather, essentially. Yeah. And she's barely in it, as you yeah. say. Like, we're watching her on horse. It is kind of mesmerizing. Yeah. She, yeah. She's on horseback it's and a, just bouncing along. Shot. She's riding along a shoreline, and the water is filled with flamingos. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I, uh, totally amazing. But it's so hilariously, like, Which here's what this French director, Jean Guermin, is like, this is a horny French director. Yeah. It's like, here we this go. This is a very horny This film. is your shot. So, Gehrman had, so now we get the credits. So, let's talk a little bit of the credits. John Gehrman had directed two Tarzans in 59 and 62. And he directed the uh, Dino De Laurentiis King Kong in 76. Yes, that's right, yeah. The movie was, one of the four writers listed is David Newman. Yes. Who wrote Superman. Yes, that's correct. So, we've I've got, got some, I've got data on that when you're ready for it. Okay. One of the other writers I want to mention is Lorenzo Semple Jr., who wrote Flash Gordon and Batman 66. And, get that fucking bell ready, because he wrote a draft of Dune for De Laurentiis. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and he wrote King Kong. So, we got the same writer and director from that terrible King Kong movie. Was it a hit? I don't know. I only know it was bad. I've never seen it. Um, I watched these credits twice. Okay. I watched the end credits. I didn't see any mention of the comic. Interesting. Anyway. Okay. End credits. Now we cut to, surprisingly, Big City. This is shot in Kenya. I don't know what city this is in. But we learned there's this guy, uh, Prince Otwani. Yep. He's a American football player, it seems like. Um, comes in very modern. And I actually, when he drives up to this ministry... And he comes out, he's just dressed in ordinary clothes, and people address him as a prince. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, this is actually, maybe we're not going to have the tribal dancing stuff. Maybe we've got something progressive going I, on. I, 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 have a, I had a completely different take. To me, he's not just wearing normal clothes. He drives up in like a Corvette, yeah. a red Corvette. He jumps out, he's wearing a red bomber jacket and jeans. Uh, to my Orientalist kind of like primed uh, point of view... I saw this as aggressively Western. Right. So I'm yes. looking at a man... I think that's yeah. deliberate. Yes, uh, uh, and certainly deliberate. Yeah. He He's meant to be... We, we're meant to identify him with the with toxic Western modernity. Yes, but we don't know that that first second he gets out of the car, I don't think. He drives up. I guess maybe he's got a flash car. I don't know. But he gets out, and I was like, uh, my only feeling was relief that... <laughs> <laughs> that he wasn't going to be like... He didn't have a bone in his nose. He's not going to be like coming from, to America or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, then we find out, he goes up to this office where this geologist guy is up there, and we find out he's got, a, his brother's the king, and he's got a plan to, they've discovered that that mountain, that the Zambuli tribe, Sheena's tribe, yep. has got titanium in it, they yep. found through a geosatellite. They're yep. like, well, we got, we need that mountain, that's for yep. us, and I'm going to kill my brother. Well, he wants to, Because yep. the brother is protective of the Zambuli tribe, and doesn't let them, doesn't let, I think no doesn't allow interaction, con basically. No there's no contact with them, yep. they're a... They're an isolated yeah. tribe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here we have the makings of a theme that's never properly explored. Yeah. 
So it's yeah, it's never explored properly. But the idea is that the Z the the Zambuli are thriving because they're kept separate from the outside world. Yes. And Western Prince, yeah. in his bomber jacket and his blue jeans and his American ally, who's helped him figure out where the titanium is, he wants to kill the king that's keeping the people safe, the Zambuli tribe safe, and he wants to expose them to the more of the Western industrial complex. Well, okay, now at this stage, I'm like, okay, so they're going to go out there looking for titanium and they're going to find the red healing soil? No. Nope. And it's going to turn into that? No. No. Um, <laughs> okay, so then, oh, also for some reason, this Prince Odwani has invited a camera crew to this dinner that his brother, the king, is hosting. And the geologist is like, whoa, are you sure about that? You're going to assassinate him and you're going to have a camera crew there? And he's like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, he wants the camera crew there to record his reaction, which he believes will be right. perfect. Yeah. A perfectly surprised reaction to his brother being yeah. assassinated. Okay, cut back to the jungle. Now we get the shower scene. Uh, and the shaman has had a vision of the king dead or lying in a pool of blood. And she's like, yeah. I got to go to the city. I've never been to the city, but I'm going to go to the city and I'm going to warn the king that he's in danger. Yeah. Now at this stage, because I think it's 20 years later, is she an old woman makeup? Her neck looked really yeah. wrinkly, like I, super wrinkly. Yeah. I think in a way perhaps that she's maybe, I think so. Something's going on with her neck. Yeah. Maybe she didn't want old person makeup on her, her face. face. Yeah, I think they've like to put a little bit of white powder or something. Yeah, they've they, sort of it's very greater or a bit. Yeah, a little bit. Well, she's like a magic person. I'll, I'll give it a pass. It's okay. Um, okay, now we meet the camera crew who are flying in. This is uh, Vic Casey. <laughs> yeah, uh, is the director, and there's a cameraman named Fletch who's played by Donovan Scott, who was cast royal in Popeye. Oh, okay. Uh, and he doesn't have I didn't any, catch any, that. any more Oblivion credits, unfortunately. I don't think. So they fly in. They they as they're passing over the jungle, they see Fletch sees Sheena down there, but mm -hmm. uh, Vic Casey doesn't believe him. They arrive to interview the king. He shows up with his betrothed princess Zanda, and I was like, why can't this movie be about Princess Zanda? It's not, unfortunately. She's some French model or actress, apparently. This uh, she also it's naked in the scene. Where yes, she's receiving less, a massage. We don't get a it's full less, frontal. You, yeah. But yes, it's yes, not, he is naked, yes. It's not all. all I was reading like this in our movie, and I wasn't until later that I learned it was PG. <laughs> it just like, blows what? my mind this film is PG. Um, okay, so meanwhile, the shaman has arrived in town. There's a shot I actually love her. She's sitting on the street, and the police come up and arrest her because mm. uh, she's uh, Zambuli, and they're like, she wants, she says, take me to the king, and they're like, you're going to jail. Well, actually, these, these um, cops have. Are are on the take. Yes. So they've been well. His so the 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 princess, the consort of uh, what's Princess Zanda. Yeah. Princess Zanda. Otwani's. Oh, she's, she's having. A, she's in an affair with Otwani, although yeah. she's engaged she's, to the king. She's engaged to the king, but she's having an affair with Otwani, and it's very. It's not really. We don't find out what kind of system of government they have in this country, but she's in charge of the police, and she's given them somehow. She has influence over the police. In fact, you know, I, I'm pretty sure it's some kind of absolute monarchy, and yet so much of their plot depends on dumb stuff like like four guys and a mercenary army. Presumably, Otwani controls once he becomes king. Presumably, he controls the resources of the state. Yeah. But instead, he's messing around with foreign mercenaries, and he needs shaman as as the as to take the fall for him murdering his brother. He's like, you don't need any of these things. You're no. in charge of the so country he's got, now. So he's got that. He's got his mercenary army waiting in this hotel on one floor. Yeah. They're all just, the basement. They're in the basement. They're in the basement. Um, now this is so. Wani comes in to Zanda's when she's getting the massage, and he says, "Did you hear? There's a." Zambuli, the shamans, the shamans in town. He says, yeah. How would he have heard of that? Yeah. How would that information reach him? She was sitting on the street and then she got arrested. Yeah. And then she says, Zanda says, yes, she's been arrested. And he's yeah. like, what? How, how did she know? How did they know? She just walked into, this one woman walked into town out of the jungle and they're, somehow I, it's... I, it's not worth, I mean... Who cares? But I suppose it's possible that there was someone saw her before she ended up on that street corner, and it reached the palace through. Oh, and, and they then both they heard them about it. Yeah, her and they both heard about it from the same kind oh, of like. Okay. But I, I hate myself that I'm even bothering to think it through. I kind of thought you might have some answers to these <laughs> questions I had about this movie. So basically, they have this big dinner party. Uh, they. Otwani sets up a crossbow with a arrow up in a tree, 
and at a precise moment it's set off and it kills the king at the dinner table. Awani ostensibly freaks out. Uh, over, the the camera crew is there it, filming all this stuff happening. Well, they're, they're busy filming the princess's breasts. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> they notice the princess's decolletage. <laughs> and... Know. Excellent. They're like, he's like, he says boobs to the left. Make sure you film those boobs. That's the words he used. Use the boobs. Tits. You know what I mean? He says. Yeah. And the cameraman turns. He's like, whoa, we get a close up. This is very, this movie is so male gazy. So at yeah. this point, I'd lost oh, yeah. that on. Oh, yeah. That one thing that I was maybe hoping for. I don't know if he went through the Wikipedia comments from the studio head about this movie. Where he said he's hoping to make a movie that is for a six, his six year old daughter would have a superhero. Yeah. And that he could take, fa families could go to together. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, you know, what did he say? I've got a, I've got a quote which I also pulled off the Wikipedia page, which incidentally is a really messy Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, which said, the comic book concept was hopelessly outdated. This is one of the producers, Arato, the guy that chopped it around in the 70s. It involved the killing of endangered species and also had racist overtones. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. We decided to create our own interpretation of Sheena Quinn of the John McGall. She is a modern contemporary woman. <laughs> She is much more cognizant of ecology. She is much less violent. She's like shooting guys with arrows at the end of the yep. movie. Sheena is an 80s film, so Sheena is an 80s woman living in the jungle. Okay. That was not the studio head I was thinking of. That no. was some producer. But anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. So they film her breasts. And anyway, the king gets killed. Uh, this plan, and they... incidentally, so much could go wrong. This, 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 mm -hmm. this crossbow is not being fired by a person. It's automated. Yeah. So it's pointing at the seat where he's going to be... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's time to go off when he stands up and makes a speech. So many things could go yeah. wrong. Yeah. So Someone... they, put a, they put a Zambuli arrow in there because now that the... Zambuli Shaman is in town. Yeah, they can. And they're like, well, we can frame her. And they immediately they pull her in. They're like, they, they, we found this bow. It's the same That's the really arrow. Of She's Zan, Princess Zanda is the one that pulls the she pulls the arrow out of his chest at the table. This is a crime scene. <laughs> Leave, don't touch the victim or pull the weapon out. So she That's... pulls it out. She says, this is a Zambuli arrow. They bring in the Shaman. She does not protest her innocence. They just take her away. As far as I remember, they take her to jail. In jail, she does the cup to forehead move. Yeah. And she sends a, a beam, a psychic message to Sheena, who is eating a strawberry. She's lounging on the grass, eating a strawberry. It looks like a Playboy shoot. It's so funny. And she suddenly gets a psychic signal. And, okay, she gets up. She summons her uh, zebra. Now, can zebras be ridden like horses? Well, no. But it's it's, so is this a horse that's been painted or is it just it's a... It's absolutely a horse that's been painted. Okay, that's what I guessed. Yeah. But I mean, it looks like a horse that's been painted. Right. <laughs> well, it also neighs and whinnies, which I don't know that zebras no, they make don't. horse they noises sort of, like that. They don't. They make a different sound. They're sort of like whooping. Okay. Well, this horse... This zebra neighs. <laughs> yeah. No, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very definitely a painted horse. Yeah. So... Meanwhile, the, the video footage taken by the f film crew, they discover there's proof on there that it was a crossbow that killed the king, not the Zambuli woman yeah. with a bow. And they're like, aha, this is proof that there's... They also accidentally stumbled across the mercenary army in the basement. They did, yeah. Just by chance. Yes. In, in, a, in a quite a funny little scene, actually. Yeah. And it's quite well shot, you know, the, the it's the classic kind of like gag where the elevator opens on something unexpected, and in this case it's a bunch of guys cleaning weapons, yeah. very rough looking customers, yeah. and one of them starts walking towards them, menacingly holding yeah. a machine gun, and uh, one of them, Fletch I think, says, sorry, wrong floor, yeah. <laughs> mashes the guy's yeah. door button, yeah. and then they think no more about it. Yeah. So they want to, the film crew, or uh, uh, Vic and Fletch, Vic wants to interview the Zambuli shaman yeah. at jail. So they yep. go to the jail, but at the same time, Sheena shows up riding her zebra yep. along with an elephant and a monkey. A little yep. two monkeys, maybe. Yep. Well, at least one monkey. Yep. Elephant it, crashes through the wall of the jail. It's pretty cool. They go in there. The monkey picks up the keys. The monkey knows what keys are. This monkey's never been to a city before. Picks up the keys and throws them to Sheena. Knows that Sheena knows the key, needs those keys. Kina, Sheena knows that she needs the keys to open the jail cell. Although she's later on, she doesn't know what binoculars are in this movie. No, but she's she like, knows. I know what keys are, and I know I need them to open the cell. And so yeah. does the monkey. Yeah. So she That's opens the cell. She rescues uh, the shaman, and they escape back into the woods. Yeah. Now the bad guys, Otwani, uh, he wants he obviously this woman can give him away. 
Uh, the shaman. shaman. Well, can so she? Like, I don't think she can. Not really, but he's kind of worried about it. I don't like, know. Here's another thing. Why is he worried about it? He has no reason to be worried about it. He goes, she can give me away. She can, you know, she, no one, is, what are you talking about? She was, what, she was saying, I didn't do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's a reason for he, he him no to take his army shit. into the jungle. Vic and Fletch go into the, uh, the jungle, I guess, just to chase the story of this white woman that's yeah. that's riding a zebra. They're like, what's going on here? And to chase up the whole story about the assassination. They go into the jungle. Um, now, this is... I laughed so hard so many times in this movie, yeah. unintentionally. Yeah. But there's a scene where they they stop their Jeep and Sheena swings down onto the Jeep. So she's in a... She's standing on the hood of the Jeep. Yeah. So we can only see her legs. She starts gunning down. So now we get the crotch shot. Yeah. And then she gets it lower. And then we get the boobs shot. Yeah. And it takes a long time before we get to actually see her face and her acting in this scene. Earlier, so I was like, "It's oh, it's kind of okay. She's okay." I mean, she was like, she did a year on Charlie's Angels. Mm -hmm. I'm like, she's doing okay on the early. Season. This scene, I was like, "Whoa!" Like she is on another planet. I guess you know she grew up in the jungle. Maybe that's an excuse. But her pose, she's striking this pose where she's got this crotch out pose. It's hilarious. The whole and the camera's just like right there on her. Yeah. Now. I will say her abs are amazing. Sometimes when she flexes her abs, it's like holy moly. And her thighs are like thunder thighs. They're like powerful. She's in amazing shape. She's in amazing shape. But she is struggling to deliver some of these lines in a way. I mean, how would a jungle person react to this stuff? It's but anyway. So yeah. she. You forgot to mention that at this in this scene there are three lions. Also. On yes. So they, yes, they they the lions attack the jeep first, etc. And she kind of swings up in on the jeep. On the jeep. Like, also, cubs, is, I don't know if lions and lionesses hunt with their cubs as a family well, all are, together. These are under the control of Sheena, it's okay. Oh, so, she didn't rescue them from the lion, she sent the lion. I'm pretty sure that's what happened, yeah. But then she paints a magic barrier, a circle in the a sand which keeps animals out, including mosquitoes, according to Fletch. Yep. So, why would she do that? I don't no, know I don't why know. she bothered doing know. that. It doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Um, but it is pretty it's pretty impressive the way these these animals are very well trained uh, and they just like once a, a, a lion with a great big a male lion with a great big mane sticks his head in through the side of the yeah. of the car through the car window yeah. this is right up against Fletch right up against the actor yeah there's one on the roof there's one on the hood like are these are big cats yeah. Yeah, the animal work in this movie is really good. I hope I have, they were treated well. I I have uh, I have so much information relevant to this topic, <laughs> which I can't wait to tell you. Okay, about. so he Vic says I want to record you, and he has a recorder, and she doesn't know what that is. Now I don't know. She must have been three or four years old. Surely she would have some memory of civilization. I don't. The things like yeah. cars and like she arrived in a jeep. Doesn't she know what these? She things? doesn't. She doesn't. She arrived at the jail. She went to town and blew up the jail. She knew where the jail was. It's not consistent. You know, she's she's not. They're not riding in the car, and she's not saying what is this. But she doesn't. She doesn't know what gasoline is, like what petrol is, because yeah, she says she calls the cars it water need to that, drink water. The water that the, the wagons. She calls the them wagons. wagons. Yeah. Uh, you're right. It's not consistent. But. We've seen this before. Lots of movies where they have some kind of outsider that's an alien, and sometimes they know stuff, and sometimes they don't. Yep. And it's very inconsistent because she speaks perfect English as well. It's very difficult to swallow. Um, so meanwhile, she goes to so she makes this this magic barrier. And she says, "You two stay in the barrier, so the animals won't attack you." She has to go take care of the shaman. Yep. The shaman's dying. It took me a second to realize in the background an elephant is digging her grave. Yeah. With its trunk. <laughs> crazy town. Absolute yeah. crazy town. Okay, bad guys show up in the jungle. They start shooting. So she goes back to the Jeep. The bad guys show up. They start shooting at it with machine guns. They've got so many mercenaries, so many machine guns. The bullets are hitting the ground around them. Not one yeah. bullet hits anybody. They're just like fine. It's, yeah. Yeah. The bullets are flying There's, every. I read, it's not like they're protected by the jeep. They're on the same side as the yeah, bullets. We just have squibs going off everywhere, and they're just not having any effect. No one gets shot in this film. Well, none of them. Yeah, they're just missing all the time. Yeah, like hundreds of yeah. rounds going off, and no one's ever getting hit. Yeah, and they're right there. The squibs yeah. are. At they're their about feet. five. They're not hiding behind a wall or no, something. That's right. Um, okay, so now our main characters or. Sorry, Vic and Sheena need to flee across the jungle yeah. from the bad guys. Well, at first, Fletch uh, goes back to town. He's going to smuggle the film out. Yes. So that they can get their Pulitzer or whatever. Their Emmy. That's uh, what they want. They don't want a Pulitzer. They want Emmy. <laughs> Emmy. 
It's a really tree. high priority. It's, it's a, a high fiction. motivating factor in several scenes of this movie. Like, what about the Emmy? Let's get that Emmy. I just blanked on that. I just substituted Pulitzer because why would you get an Emmy for journalism? Uh, TV news? There must be a TV news Emmy of some sort. Why would anyone want that? <laughs> I don't anyway, know. So I don't know. At this point, Vic thinks he's being taken to Shaman to interview her. Yes. He thinks she's still alive. And I don't know why Sheena would tell him that... She, she says, well, we have to travel a really long way. Because what, like, beyond To something. the afterlife. And wh where is she taking him exactly? When was she planning on telling him that yeah. she was dead? It doesn't... It's just a way to get our two main characters together. I don't know. So now we have a very long... There's a chase. The bad guys are attacking. There's a tree climbing scene. Uh, which is there for butt shots. A lot of butt shots on this tree climb. Anytime camera, she goes up or down a tree. The camera spends about half of this film up Sheena's loincloth. Yeah. Uh, but there is a surprise. <laughs> when, uh, when Vic is wearing a sarong at the end of the movie and it's breezy, you get a shot You get a shot of uh, what's going on under his sarong there. And I was a bit surprised at the Why director not? left. You know, like we've seen everything there is to see of Sheena. Yeah. Why not see a bit of Vic? Incidentally, Vic, um, he's... A very much regular guy physique. And he spends, I guess there's a yeah. different standard for what a leading, in what kind of shape a leading man could be in, in this time. It's not like now where they will shove, we've talked about this before a little bit, I think, when with Gwendolyn. Uh, it's not like now where the, where you'll get, the leading man will get shoved into fat camp for six weeks before shooting even starts yeah. and will come out a muscle bound monster. But she's supposed to like outpace him and outrun him and all that stuff. And this tree climbing scene, she's very athletic in it. Like she, oh yeah, when he's attacked by a snake in the tree, she swings down upside oh, down. To but we would, he's and she pulls him be, up by her foot. Yeah, it's amazing. But he's he's clearly meant to be sexy man, right? I think like he's meant to film, be handsome man. A film would, yeah, handsome man, handsome man. Uh, even now, they would get him into Hollywood shape, yeah. and then just tell us that he can't keep up with the. Yeah. But we yes, just, we would right. just accept that yeah. all men look like this with their shirt off, whereas this bloke looks more like a normal person <laughs> yes. with his shirt <laughs> yes. off. And it's so funny now, being I guess acclimatized to what Hollywood now thinks is normal human being with you know like bulging everywhere. This guy, he's con his shirt's constantly open. And I'm like, do you have your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be lots of no one wants along to along. see that. <laughs> yeah. She talks about how furry he is as well. None of the men in the tribe are furry. She says, you are yeah. covered in fur. She, I mean, she said that when she was completely stark naked. Yes. Yeah, so I guess she shaves her legs out there in the jungle. She shaves everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they go out, there's a, so here's where we get some amazing cinematography. Mm. Um, there's a scene where they're crossing the desert and the camera's just backing up. I said, that camera's gonna stop. No. They keep going and going and going. You get a huge, huge shot of the desert and them crossing it at a vast, amazing there distance. There's some great. There's great a shot shots. where they find, where he kisses her by the lake mm. and all the flamingos are on there and the camera pans across the flamingos. It's like something like, out, of, out of Africa. I and cannot believe, I could another, not believe this yeah. movie did not deserve this level of cinematography. So the, the, there's a shot later on where, where, with a helicopter, there's a lot of shots with a helicopter and the helicopter shots are really good. Yes. Someone really knows how to shoot these helicopters to make it look dynamic as it's flying around. As it's flying around. And there's a scene where the helicopter lands in front of Sheena and Vic and it's it's all one take. Yeah. You yeah. know, think about how it would be shot now with about 50 different edits. The uh, DP it, was Pasqualano DeSantis. He won an Oscar. Won an Oscar for Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I picked up on that too. Yeah. And boy. What's he doing? Even, he couldn't even suck properly no. like everyone else in this movie. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. That shot of the helicopter landing. Yeah. It's just one take. Yeah. I just think about well, all the yeah, and all the animals, all that stuff that he shot, all that stuff is. And uh, you know, an amazing thing they do is um, sometimes when she uses her psychic powers, you'll just. It's very clever. They just took shots of animals turning their heads, yeah. and they just cut yeah. them in there. So like all the birds are turning to look one way, all the lines are looking one way. They just snuck those in there in a way that it makes it look like they're responding to her. And yeah. It was really a clever little touch. Yep. Um, Nothing wrong with the cinematography in this film, except no. for the inordinate amount of time. Oh, spent. and even the. We haven't talked about the cinematography. The action scenes, they, the bad guys attack this village on the way just for kicks. Yeah. And the explosions and like the, they're shooting like rockets into this village and it looks wild. That scene is good because we see it from far away. We yes. don't see it from close up. Yeah. Later on, we get a terrible action scene when the tribes people attack the, um, attack the mercenaries yes. in that valley. Yes. And that's yes. awful. 
Yeah. But uh, that particular scene that you're referring to, it's like something out of Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Even the head of the mercenaries is, is looks kind of like Colonel Kurtz. He actually looks, at one point, oh, he, he comes like... in with no shirt on, wearing his holster, so he looks like Travis Bickle. Yeah. <laughs> or he, and he also he kind of reminds me a little bit of Rutger Hauer in Blade Runner. As yes, well. I think we were got supposed to assume cap. he is he South African based on his accent. Maybe I'm not sure. He seems very he, blonde. You're he just, right. He's a Rutger Hauer looking yeah, guy. Yeah, he's just a, a, a terrifying blonde, foreign, like unscrupulous mercenary guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is the so as they're crossing the desert, we get the bit about the binoculars where she doesn't know. What now you are tiny. Yeah, well, she looks now like you have become you're a, a giant. You're a, you're a pygmy. You're a giant. No, she's looked at reflections and lights and stuff. She has some concept of what these things are. And, like, and she grew up she, in Western society until she was like four. Wow. Well, this is madness. And yet the chimpanzee knows how to use keys and knows <laughs> that they're necessary to open a jail cell. Yep. Yep. This is the kind of uh, this is the pedophogging nitpicking that I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So. She is, they're captured, they have to surrender in the scene where the helicopter lands, which you mentioned. Mm. She is taken away by Princess Xanda. Princess Xanda does, is jealous of her. Of course. Because Otwani is like, well, I'm, he's constantly, he's very um, chauvinist, yeah. patriarchy, patriarchal kind of guy. He's like, I'm the man. If I want to have sex with this white tribal priestess, I'm going to do it. Oh, he's like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not really going to, but he keeps talking about it. Like, oh, when I have you alone. So I, the Princess Xanda's like, uh-uh. She's got some I'm gonna female throw her, jealousy going on. I'm going to so she... throw her off a, a waterfall or something. Well, she's going to she's going to take her off in the helicopter. She's going to... She buzzes the tribes people, and then she says she's going to throw Sheena out of the helicopter, and she's going to fall into the waterfall, and that's going to impress the tribes people, but it's really because she's jealous of it. Yeah. Incidentally, the mission at some point has shifted from catching Sheena to securing the mountain. Again, why well, do they need to secure... This mountain They is, wanted that titanium, I... But this mountain is in your, the borders of the country you are now the king of. Yes. You don't need to secure it from anything. Yeah. You can mine it at your leisure. Yeah. Maybe he's a constitutional monarch. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of this <laughs> And that's why he has to do all this so, on the down low, because he's not... There's a prime minister who's actually in charge right. of the army, perhaps. Right. So, while they're in the heli... Well, in that case, why does he need to assassinate his yeah. brother? Yeah. <laughs> Sheena and Xander are up in the helicopter. She's about to be thrown off, but Sheena pretends she has a headache so she can touch her forehead and summon the swans, and the swans all it's swoop the in. Flamingos, flamingos. The flamingos. Uh, terrible special effects. Yeah, awful. Uh, some of it looks like it's animated. Uh, the, several shots, obviously, the helicopters are moving, yep. and there's, like, puppet uh, flamingos' heads. Yeah, someone's holding their... a flamingo head and is just jabbing it. On, yeah. on, on camera and sometimes it looks like there's like drawings of like flamingos flying past. Anyway, it's really, really bad, pretty yeah. bad. And uh, Xanda falls out to her death. By the way, beautiful shot of the waterfall. Yeah. Beautiful. There's some good, sh uh, and of all of the uh, the tribes people running around. Yeah. Uh, sort of converging on the waterfall, standing at different points. Like it looks great. Yeah. So uh, she falls out the the pilot. Is like he's in a daze because he's I've been pecked like like in Hitchcock's The Birds. Yeah. And uh, eventually the thing crashes. Uh, how did Sheena get out of that? She just jumps out. Oh, she just jumped out. Okay. And then she has a really dumb white savior speech where she uh, again so like the locals never thought of fighting back until Sheena jumps out of a helicopter and says. Is this the point where there's one point where she gets, starts a sentence and mid sentence she starts swinging from a vine like Tarzan. <laughs> But it's like ADR, like it's the sentence doesn't it's little, shift at all. It's a little later. Like it's not like she's far away. That's it's just after exactly. This. That's just after this. And then she's chained up. We never figure out how she gets out of the chains. So she jumps out of the air, out of the helicopter. The helicopter then crashes. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look good because it's clearly a prop helicopter. Right. Uh, the, the rotors aren't even turning anymore. It just slowly <laughs> right. <laughs> moves into a rock and then explodes. Uh, then Gina holds up her chained arms and says, look, even in chains, I, I defy them. And, you know, Z Zambali warriors, remember your warlike heritage. Remember m thousands of moons ago when you were the greatest warriors of the age. They keep mentioning some woman who, the one, she who was the something. This person is some goddess type has mentioned a few times and I thought it was going to come back. Oh, oh I, d I didn't. I don't remember that at all. No worries. And then somehow she gets the chains off. And then, as you say, there's a scene later on where there's some badly ADR'd. She starts a sentence and then, then she's, she's swinging, swinging through the trees. She's swinging away. And still delivering But the we line. still hear the line as though she were right in, in the front. middle. Of, she never stopped saying the sentence. Yeah, funny. So Vic, meanwhile, has 
revealed, he's been captured by Adwani, he reveals to Adwani that he has proof, footage. Yep. He says, I'll cut you a deal, I'll give you the footage if you Sign declare to the UN yep. that the Zambuli are independent. Yeah. I'm like, wait a second, what, what is any of this? Why, does Why he do you need to go to the, the UN? Why does he care about the Zambuli? He's never met them. He, yeah. I don't even know if he knows what they're called. Um, so his thing is, he's why is he giving this murderer, this assassin, his freedom yeah. to rule his country with an iron fist, yeah. presumably, for this deal? This why does this have to go before the UN? Exactly. What does the UN have to do with any of it? It's this is why this is part of the government thing. I was like, well, how is this government structure that hmm. we need to get independence for this tribe Sorry. from the UN? Because we... why are, are they not independent already? What does that mean? What does independence mean? Yeah, exactly. Does that mean yeah? Do they get a seat on the UN? <laughs> no, well, it's because we're supposed to care about the Zambuli, and so yes. he cares about the Zambuli. But he's never, as I said, he's never met them. He's never met one. All he, he knows Sheena, and that's it. Yeah. But, you know, he wants a, he wants that Emmy. That's what he wants. Yes. So, well, but now he wants independence for a tribe of people he's never met and has no conception of. And he's willing to trade evidence of a murder for it? That no. seems crazy. No. So, anyway, he's... They put him in a jeep to take him back to the city to get the tape. Yep. But Art Wani says, well, he doesn't come back. It's a one-way trip for him. He says that in the earshot of Vic. Yes. Vic's right in there. He's so, right well, there. Well, okay, well, I guess we're just staying here then. Yeah. So, uh... But he just went anyway. Yeah. At least wait till he's out of earshot before you say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sheena rounds up the troops. They're going to launch a counterattack. Like, he yeah. walks against, um... Except way worse. Uh, yeah. Way so worse. They basically use bows and arrows. Oh, we get some amusing an animal antics. Yes, she's, she summons all the animals as well. Yeah. We so get the chimps well. throwing rocks. Yeah. Funny, funny scenes with chimps pulling pins out of grenades with their lips. Yes. And then throwing the grenade. Uh, a chimp hilariously straining to lift a rock that's too big for it. And then a larger chimp coming in and throwing I that know, rock. The chimps know what grenades are. But they're just magic chimps. And how chimps. they function. They're magic chimps. They're magic chimps. Uh, it's luck. It's pure luck. Yeah. It's luck that he pulled the pin out and threw it. Uh, an elephant, elephants pushing cars over, um, ri a rhino, a real live rhino running around, yeah. running around people, yeah. uh, mashing its horn into cars. It's pretty intense yeah. stuff. I don't yeah. think I've ever really seen anything like it. Uh, Telugu Superman had some elephant action. Oh, that would be the only <laughs> other time I've seen anything like that. I mean, that was fucking fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess that's, I'm enjoying these Numbered scenes. elephants, Yeah. yeah. In that movie. Yeah, uh, you're right. That's the only other thing I could possibly yeah. compare to this. So, um, so Vic is out of the picture for a long swath of this movie. Like, yep. minutes, he's not in it. Yep. It's like he's been forgotten. Actually, he escapes from his... Uh, from the jeep. Yep. Uh, he attacks his, the people who tied him up, etc. He manages to get away. Uh, Atwani escapes from the rest of his troop. So, Sheena is chasing him on Zebraback. Yep. She's firing arrows at him. He fires a shot and actually clips her in the shoulder. It's the only time anyone gets shot. The only shot. time anyone gets shot. Um, she manages to hit him with an arrow. The Vic's Jeep and Wani's Jeep crash and explode. Huge yeah, explosion. Amazing. So Just it's from it, is doing the Prometheus style of running away from something. So she's running in a straight line away from a Jeep that's bearing down on her in the middle of a plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She could just go left or right. Yeah. yeah but she doesn't. No. And uh, meanwhile, you know, Twan is out of the picture because he's taken an arrow to the chest. So he, and then Vic comes in and saves her, as you say, by running the jeep into the side. And as you said, there's an, a, a colossal explosion. Vic is thrown from the jeep on fire. Yes, yes. And you know, he's rolling around trying to put the fire out. Yeah. Sheena runs up to him. He's badly he, burned. He's crispy. Yeah. He delivers some terrible maudlin dialogue. Again. That I don't know that I'll get a PG rating. Yeah, his 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 arm is just completely blackened, and he talks about dying from his burns. Did uh, Revenge of the Sith get a PG thirteen? No idea. Hmm. Okay. Probably. Um. Yeah, I think it did actually, and of course Anakin gets barbecued at the end of that. Well, uh, there you go. So he's uh, been really bad. Sheena and Vic have fallen in love. Incidentally, it's probably worth mentioning. Yes. I, for yes. no reason. He kissed again. her twice. She's like, "What is this kissing?" She's not an Teach alien. Teach me to love. She is human. Captain in a Kirk? tribe with yeah. people who mate and yeah. have relationships and children. <laughs> yeah, well, here's the thing, you know, there's no reason for her and Vic to fall in love. Except no. for the script demands it. So, in fact, the second time he kisses her, she gave a line which I thought was a good line. She says, enemy. you're an enemy. He says, what? He says, she says, an enemy is one who takes without asking. And it was a line that Shaman had delivered to her earlier in the film, too. Yeah. She goes to the city to confront an enemy. What? En what's an enemy? An enemy is one who takes without asking. And the prince is going to take without asking by killing the king. But it doesn't go anywhere. No, of course she's... It's not like the because reason... Because she's... 
she's she's being taught to live. Yeah. So um, they use the uh, magic soil to resurrect Vic. As this is that, the only other time the magic soil is mentioned. Just like the, the first scene, he's buried up to his neck in the sand, and they do the dance, and they pull him out. He comes back to life. Um, he's nude in that scene, by the way. You get to yep. see his butt for a moment before a guy, before a guy runs wraps up him up and wraps him in a sarong. Yeah. Uh, and then the next day we see, so he had told her that he was going to take her back to the city and show her the modern world. Yeah. And, and at the end of the movie, he's mind. like, you know, I can't do that because they'll come here and they'll, they'll ruin all of this to get that Again, soil. This is the stillborn theme of the film. Yeah. Which but he's not. got some of that soil in a cup, which he's going to take, which they weren't allowed to do. Her parents were not allowed to do at the start of the movie. Yeah, that's right. But I guess he's pinched it <laughs> without permission. She, doesn't, she, doesn't, she care. doesn't know it's sacred ground. I don't know. She doesn't care. Yeah, why is it okay for him to take it and not for the parents at the start? But he's like, look, he's like, this could cure cancer. Because that's what the script says. I'm going to take it, but I'm not going to take you because they will Tear you poke apart. and prod you, etc. Yeah. And uh, you stay here. They're not going to, they only care about, they don't care about the psychic animal summoning. No. They only care about soil. Anyway. He just wants the soil. He flies away. She sheds a tear um, as she sees his plane fly away. Yep, and, and then we get a repeat of final credits. We get the zebra riding past the flamingos. Yep. This time it's a full shot. It just doesn't look it's like, not it. just it's not as sexual. bouncing sexual. breasts the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah and uh, that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Oh, and he's listening to a recording of her saying, I love you over and over. Yeah, it's because he, re he recorded her voice. Yeah. But yeah, again, th this ending doesn't make any sense. Uh, he wanted, I suppose he's supposed to have given up on the idea of winning that Emmy. Yeah, yeah. And now he's dedicated himself to nobler goals, namely A, curing cancer with magic dirt, and B, protecting the Zambuli tribe yeah. because china and the tribe need to be separated from modern the modern world in order to live happily and healthily. if i can vaguely play devil's advocate he did see that village getting destroyed yeah so he does sort of know that they're vulnerable maybe yes yeah i, I agree it's there it's all there but yeah. it's not given enough no. emphasis it's still born yeah hmm. well i think it's time for everyone's favorite segment cishet male solve sexism Okay, so if it's not clear just yet, this is a really sexist movie. And it, it's kind of annoying because the comic is a mess, right? Yeah. We've discussed it's a racist, poorly written, poorly drawn heap of trash. But one thing that is interesting about it, I won't say redeeming, but I will say interesting, is that Sheena is very much a kind of strong female character. She's the one that saves Bob. She never needs saving. Yeah. She's the one that does the saving. Yeah. None of the kind of typical... She's never a damsel in distress. She's never... She never has to be rescued. If she's tied up, the monkey rescues her, as we mentioned. Mm. Jim rescues her, not uh, Bob. She's, like, tough. A tough kind of superhero. It's... I, you could, I don't know if you could call it a redeeming feature, but it is pretty interesting for the period. Yeah, yeah. And she's unambiguously the goody, too. Yeah. But, and I mean, she... She does, ultimately, she's reinforcing the status quo because she, as I said, she just delivers, she doesn't inflict her own kind of justice on people. You know, she doesn't throw anyone down a pit or chuck rocks on them or whatever. She delivers them up to the colonial police. So she's part of the, I guess, the imperialist kind of like state of affairs right. in Africa. But that's, this is a minor point. And this, I, this kind of makes the sexism of the movie even more galling, mm. arguably, because you have the only good thing about the comics is that it's well. You wouldn't call it feminist, but she's she's not a sexist cliche. She's not like the Haggard's character and she like a malicious, conniving, ambitious, out of turn woman. But here, you know, okay, first of all, she's naked all the time. Okay, it's yes. this is the, the male gaze is constant in this yeah. film. Yeah, when she's not naked, she's wearing this loincloth. She never wears anything else. And as we pointed out, ad nauseum, the camera... Lingers. L yes, lingers. Uh, half the film, it, I feel like we're looking up her skirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the rest of the time we're looking down her shirt. Yeah. Uh, I will say, I, she does get herself out of those chains, so to speak. Yeah. Because she, or she escapes from the helicopter... Yeah. With the help of her animal. She friends. does, true, true, of course. But she needed still, magic powers she's to She's still able to a do. tough, like, she's still doing tough stuff. She shoots guys with arrows, yeah. she swings through the jungle. She's still kind of like, very much kind of like a Tarzan character. Yeah. Very physical, very physically capable. But there's lots of other stuff too. She has moments of what I would call feminine weakness. Mm -hmm. 
Like when she sees the village burning up, she's affected by it, obviously. Yeah. But instead of being affected with steely resolve the way comic... He has Gina to hide would... her face from him. He says, yes. don't look, don't look. Yes. Yeah. He, Vic is the one that protects he her. Has to her. She has to... She buries her face in his furry chest. Yeah, this is very like the comic Sheena who has been warring year after year and like that that tribe wants revenge because we beat them in war. Comic Sheena, year. if she'd seen her village being burned, we would just hear about how it was revenge time. Yeah. I was, or how they know, burned it because out of or, revenge. Or they burned it out of revenge because I burned I, their village I last, burned the year. last year. Yeah. yeah. But she would have had nothing but steely resolve. Or is this, you know, and later on she does things like falls down and he has to help her up. Oh, I don't remember that bit. No, it's just a, yeah. you know, he's very much becoming the male protector role towards the end of the film. I think and a... ultimately, he's the one that decides her fate for her. She doesn't decide to stay in the valley. She wants to go see the modern world with him, but he says, no, you got to stay here. I know what's best for you. And there's, it's just really disappointing. There's a um, video on YouTube, I don't know who made it, it's called Born Sexy Yesterday. And this guy has identified this trope of um, movies where men are attracted to women who have babyish intelligence. Yeah. Uh, like Splash yeah. or Tron 2 are some of his I examples. Think, yes, that's that's excellent. It's it's uh, I think it's just a, a kind of heightened form of the ingenue. Right. So I would have I would say that yeah, you're right. The, the baby ingenue, or, or, or the childlike ingenue. Well, ingenues but are she doesn't childlike. know what binoculars are. That, yeah. when, that scene, yeah. I was like, oh, this is a born sexy yesterday type of That's thing. an excellent trope. Yeah, I, I would see that as kind of like a sub-trope of, of, of the ingenue. Ingenue, of course, is, we talked about this, I think, in Barbarella, is a, a character that's a complete innocent. Yeah. And will usually engage in a kind of chaste romantic relationship right. with the hero, which very much occurs in this film, because they, they just kiss a couple of times, that's it. They maybe spend the night together. He tells her to put out the do not disturb sign. Oh yeah, final yeah, scene. at the end of the movie, yeah. yeah. But it's a very kind of pure and harmless relationship. Yeah, yeah. Whereas usually the, the danger or the kind of like the tension in the plot will come from the efforts of the villains to drag the innocent girl into the sordid realities of the modern world. Yeah. And I, once again, I think that's very much occurring here. Uh, and this is this is a kind of characterization of women that doesn't really get a lot of mileage these days because of it's, because it's infantilizing. Mm. So it's disappointing to see, especially since it's nothing like the sole good thing about <laughs> comics. Yes. Yeah. Which is that she's real tough yeah. in comics. Mm. Yeah. All right, uh, trivia. So this film had a budget of $25 million and it made $5.8 million. Wow. So very much a flop. Yeah. Uh, you can see, kind of see the money on screen though. I oh think. yeah, especially with the animals. Animals, the cinematography, the explosions. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is a this is a feature film. Yeah. This is a big. This is a proper studio movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, the. Producer that I mentioned earlier, Paul Arato, who I quoted about bringing Sheena into the 80s, uh, he bought the rights to the film in 1974. Just decided that he just figured it, he just wanted to make a Sheena film. That was precedent because that was that TV series. Right. So he shopped it around for a few years with a few different studios. I, I think he originally wanted Raquel Welsh to play Sheena. Uh, Bo Derek was another potential Sheena right. whose name was mentioned a bit. And as you mentioned, eventually Columbia Studios picked it up in uh, 19. 80. Uh, in line with his desire to bring it up to date, uh, he he got uh, script writers. So as you mentioned, the final credit goes to David Newman, who wrote Superman, but the first script was by S Leslie Stevens, hmm. uh, who I think is maybe famous in our circles for directing Incubus, which is the Esperanto film starring William Shatner. Whoa! <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, that is a fun fact. His original script was apparently very fantastical, with a Chariots of the Gods kind of thing. Whoa, so okay. Like where I guess the Zambu Zambuli were going to be aliens or something. Right. Or have alien tech. That was, you know, like the, the execs at Columbia didn't like that. It was too fantastical. And that's, they brought in David Newman at that point to give us kind of what eventually became the final script. A bunch of other people doctored it, as you pointed out, but essentially Newman... Yeah, it gets the credit. Uh, as far as casting is concerned, Tanya Roberts really wanted this role. Mm. She lobbied hard for it, and she trained for ten months. Wow! Uh, getting into the amazing it, shape, yeah, incredible shape. Huge biceps too, in some shots. Uh, she she took up weightlifting, right? To, uh, and bareback horse riding, <laughs> but she didn't read any of the comic books. Sure, I don't think anybody did. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Lady Tarzan. It's really that's that's all the concept needs to be. And you can yes. just address it with whatever. Yeah. You're you're completely There's right. There's nothing. In the comics, beyond that, even. 
All right, so now I want to talk oh, briefly. Oh, Let me just interrupt for a second. I did find the quote, and it is from Aratau, and I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. Girls today need superheroes. I have a daughter who is six who needs someone to look up to, and I want Sheena to be that superhero. I also want Sheena to be a character that parents will want to send their kids to see and the type of picture that parents can go to see with their children. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, there was certainly a lot of looking up in this movie, yeah. which is not the kind that he meant, I think. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the animals and the okay. animal training. Yeah. Because this film is remarkable for the amount of live animals that yeah. they have and how well trained they are. The animal trainer was a guy called H.G. Wells, mm. <laughs> or Hubert Wells. Okay or Hubert G. Wells, as he was better known, uh, an animal trainer who worked in Hollywood for 45 years, had a storied career uh, that included the original 1967 Dr. Doolittle. He also did Out of Africa. He did Babe, Pig in the City, which okay. is an Australian film famous for all the animals. Great movie. It? Yeah. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Okay. Uh, do you remember that scene on the train where uh, Indy has to... He yeah. uses the bullwhip on the lion. Yeah. He falls into a carriage with a lion in it. The opening, opening sequence, right? Yes, the opening Young sequence Indy, with yeah. uh, River Phoenix. Yeah. Dracula. Oh, with the wolf. With the wolf. And he was in front of the camera for that. He played a zookeeper. Whoa, okay. But he also had lows. He did Mac and Me. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Beastmaster 3, The Eye of Braxis. Oh, wasn't Tanya Robertson in Beastmaster 1? She, was, she was in Beastmaster 1. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> In the end, he did 150 films and 200 TV Whoa. shows. Okay. I read his memoirs as preparation for this wow. episode. Okay. <laughs> it's called uh, Lights, Camera, Lions. Huh. And of all the films that he talks about doing, he has the most praise for this one. Interesting. It was his favourite, not because it was good, but because of all the amazing yeah. work he got to do on it, and for the fact that for once, money was apparently no object. Yeah, right. Uh, he says in his memoirs, he led a remarkable life, incidentally. Amazing. Born in Hungary during, before World War II, participated in the kind of like the Hungarian uprising against the Soviet Union. Whoa. Okay. Refugee in Austria, went to America, took up animal training, worked all over the world. Fascinating bloke. And his memoirs are actually really funny. Mm. Uh, they're, they're they're quite funny. I can recommend them. Like, okay. for example, you know, the, he he when he talks about the kind of like the animal training company that he worked for going bankrupt, and that chapter in the book is chapter eleven. Right. <laughs> it's right. the 11th chapter of the book yeah. where he talks about the studio going bankrupt. It's full of just funny little details like that. Anyway, talk a little bit about. So he says, for me and my crew, this yarn about a female Tarzan was sheer fun. It was the pinnacle of our professional life. Mm. So, apparently, he reckons that he holds the record for most animals shipped into Africa. Yeah, right. <laughs> because, of course, all his trained animals were in the US. Yeah, right. So, they didn't use all that, that elephant, the rhino, the lions. They're all from America. Yeah. He had to fly them over. Yeah. So, it says here, from the US, we shipped to Kenya an elephant, a rhino, four lions, three leopards, four chimpanzees, three white Arabian horses, which would be painted with stripes, mm. and 12 flamingos. Two combination passenger and cargo planes were needed to ferry all of this menagerie. My rhino, Big H, named after me, was a day late, though, because Queen Elizabeth used the same airline and my rhino was bumped off her flight for safety reasons. <laughs> uh, he... Uh, was probably in the film, as I imagine, having paused it and watching it, I think he was probably the extra that gets the lion attacked by a lion during the big oh, battle. Okay. Yeah. Remember there's one jumps on a guy? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's him. Okay. Having seen a few photos of him. Uh, God, there's just, I've got so many notes from his... <laughs> he said that Princess Elizabeth and Tanya did not get on. Uh -huh. uh, they, first of all, wouldn't speak to one another, but eventually started screaming at one another, apparently. Whoa. Uh, and in a scene where Sheena has to touch her, uh, she, quote, simply and adamantly refused to be poured by a commoner. Hmm. At which point Tanya swore at her, and she replied, you go back to the gutter. Tanya walked off, saying, I refuse to work in the same scene as that bitch. And they finished the scene with uh, the animal trainer's understudy, who happened to be a woman of equivalent height. Whoa. And they put her in the leather outfit and, the, and a wig. So I couldn't see it in the film, but apparently there's a scene where the animal trainer is a stand-in for the shaman. Huh. <laughs> I do want to tell a little story about the rhino. So okay. you remember there's that great scene where the rhino comes into shot where they're in the uh, jeep yeah. and the rhino appears. Yeah. Right, and then it turns around and leaves. So he says, uh, a, a guiding trail is constructed from logs and boulders. For reasons known only to himself, Big H actually stopped at the magic line for the shot, but that is as far as, as the miracle 
lasted. When he turned around, my lion, that was the male lion that was on the roof, Kaibor could not resist this monumental wrinkled ass. He leapt off his perch and attached himself to the rhino's posterior. The other lions scatter like sparks from a Christmas sparkler. Big H nonchalantly kicked the lion off and headed for the fence <laughs> made out of 16-inch timber, which he promptly crashed through. <laughs> oh, my God. Ran off into the jungle. Again and again in these memoirs, it talks about animals running off and yep. him having to yep. chase them. Yep. Uh, they chased him with four cars, <laughs> shot him with a half dose of tranquilizer, and then tried to lead him back to camp with a rope around his neck. At this point, his career as a movie actor was finished. <laughs> Quote. Later that day, he smashed his way out of his crate, which was also the crate he was flown in inside of, and he was supposed to fly out inside of. So he was donated to a national park huh. in Kenya, where, unfortunately, five years later, he was killed by poachers. Hmm. Uh, uh, Wells finishes this chapter saying, To hell with the critics. Sheena is my favourite movie. Huh. Interesting. Okay. That's a little spark of joy in there, I think. Yep. Oh, this one won five Razzies. Oh, did it? Yep. Okay. Worst actress. Worst director. Worst score. Huh. So far, I'm on board. Worst photography, which I don't think is fair at all, because I think it's quite... I don't think the score is bad. The photography is good. I, the, the, yeah. Uh, the score, I, I thought, was very boring. Especially the main theme, which I thought was... Well, it's crazy tedious. when they use the main theme, because it's just like a little... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, they're using it in action they scenes. They use it in action scenes. Yeah. They use it in the jailbreak. I'm like, this is the wrong song to use here. Also, weird. worst... Very weird. Worst screenplay. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Tedious. And that's it. Okay. I guess we should write this thing. <laughs> comic, come on, yay or nay? It's a nay. I, I mean, there's lots of other better more Mexican comics out there if you want to read them. Um, Even know, Flash Gordon's better than this. Yeah, and, oh, well, that was Alex Raymond art. That was, yeah. like, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, and somehow there were, some, there were like, racist. a few panels of... Oh, yeah, <laughs> we haven't done Jungle Jim, which we are, we are going to do Alex Raymond's Jungle Jim at some stage. Because I made 16 of those movies. Um... It's there were a couple of moments where like they it depended on which artist was drawing a comic, but some some of them were good at doing the landscapes a little bit, but the figures were never quite right. This was there's never A grade talent or B grade talent on these books. It was always really down the line. And um as you said the stories are bad. No, th these comics are wrong. Yeah, it's a nay for me as well. Uh film yeah or nay. Uh, nay, it's bad with some good stuff in it. Animals are good, the photography's good. Yeah, apparently this has become something of a cult. Film, it? Okay. Which I kind of guess, especially if you're in a teenager. It's funny. It's if really like there's. It's accidentally funny, unintentionally yes. funny. Yes. A lot of scenes. I was just. I could not believe. Like, and you could rent if you were 15 years old. You could, you could rent it. You could rent it. Yeah. And you probably did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this is a, a name for me as well. It's just. It's so. It's just a, a dull, offensive mess. It's two hours long. Time. Yeah. Very long. Here's long. And I have to say, I mean, earlier this month I was thinking, oh, should we choose something specific for Black History Month? And we chose this one by random. Oh, God. Oh. And I kind of felt like, oh, we've, we've done the wrong thing. <laughs> I feel pretty bad about it at the moment. Um, oh. But anyway, you know, when people are listening to this 50 years from now, they won't know that we recorded it in February. Or, or we'll be the subject of a of a scathing yes. uh, woke yeah, review, absolutely. as we have uh, been scathing. Absolutely. Of the and we'll deserve it. Uh, adaptation, yay or nay? This is a tricky one for me. Um, so, okay, Jungle Tarzan. Is it a Jungle Tarzan? Yes, it is. Now, I always go back to your yay of adaptation for Gwendoline because two people had the same name and there was nothing else in common with the comic and the movie. So by that criteria, I should say yay, but she doesn't have magic powers in the comic. Uh, it's not, if you're reading that comic and you saw this thing which is set in like modern cities, like some scenes are set in the city, you'd be like, what is this? It's not like the comic. I'm not sure if it does, I'm not sure that it has the spirit of the comic, but why would you want that spirit anyway? Because it's not really, there's not much there. There's not much meat or content. So it's very tricky. Um, I guess I have to say yay because her name is Sheena and she's a jungle queen of some sort. I guess is it which which way are you gonna go? Uh, I'm going nay. Okay. Uh, because it's just as racist as the comic, but it has the added bonus of being sexist too. That's the that's see that's the thing is I was like oh yeah the comic's racist but so is this so it kind of matches as well. Um, what what did I did I say yay or well, nay? The thing is you said yay. Oh. Before it's nay. <laughs> Because I mean, we have a stated goal. Should I from change? The, we got it. You do you. But I see we have a stated goal from the producer that he wanted to make it Sheena for the eighties. And oh yeah. 
Well, Sheena's not of the 80s. And it's not that. It's, as I said, it's still offensive and arguably more offensive because we have all the added sexism yeah. and none of the kind of like dynamism of the character really from the from the 30s. So it's a solid may for me. Uh, I'm just thinking about switching. Maybe I'll switch next week. <laughs> I'll, I'll update you next week if I've changed my mind. Jolly good. I'm really not sure. It's Tune in strange. next week. To hear, to hear Hamlet over here decide how he's going to vote yeah, on this week's yeah. adaptation. Yeah. All right. Uh, don't forget to like, oh, yeah. review, rate, subscribe. Uh, check us out on Facebook. It's the only place you'll find us, <laughs> unless you want to send us a letter in the post. No, you can contact us on Twitter, and also we have an email address in the show notes. Uh, and uh, tune in next week for... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Fantastic. 1990. So we're looking at the 40th anniversary of the comics. So we'll read the first four issues or so, or five issues. So that means one, two, three, Raphael, and then four. Cool. That's how they're numbered. There's a one-shot, Raphael one-shot in there. So, um, And we won't go further than that because then you get into the outer space arc and also the origin of the ooze, which is uh, well. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Are we going to do review. seven Mutant Turtle movies in a row? I don't think so. But maybe we might do two or maybe three. But we'll definitely do the first one, which I think is 19. It is.